shout out, I will be reviewing Amazon Prime's The Rings of Power episode by episode this fall. Please subscribe if you want to see that or more of this content. Hey you geeks, two weeks until The Rings of Power come out and Amazon has finally dropped enough new content that I can make another video. What does the chef have that's new? What is that? What is new? You it's patently unfair that they release footage from the same four or five scenes over and over again and everyone loses their mind. But last week they dropped three big reveals, which we will dive into today, which are Galadriel is now specifically on a revenge quest, Elrond is the friend of the dwarves, and the Southlanders are Proto-Mordor, Galadriel's brother. It's been hinted at over the past couple of teasers that Galadriel is in fact on a vengeance quest because of her brother. But haunted by the death of her brother and on a quest for vengeance. According to wider Tolkien canon, Galadriel has a few brothers, Finrod, Angrod, and Agnor. But the show seems to have forsaken Agnor and Angrod to focus on Finrod. At least according to Fellowship of Fans, this sad boy is Finrod and they ain't been wrong yet. Who is this creature? Who? What is he? What? How did he come to be there? How? In the Cimmerillion, the middle brothers were killed in the Battle of Sudden Flames and are not mentioned in The Lord of the Rings at all, so their exclusion from this show is understandable. Finrod is only mentioned in passing by Glorfindel to Frodo in the Shire, so the show has a bit of leeway on his story. The Cimmerillion details Finrod Felagund's rives to kingship of the Noldor, then his doomed quest with Baron to capture a Cimmeril for the hand of Luthien. Thus befell the contest of Sauron and Felagun, which is renowned. For Felagun strove with Sauron in songs of power, and the power of the king was very great, but Sauron had the mastery. He chanted a song of wizardry, of piercing, opening, of treachery, revealing, uncovering, betraying. And this is why it is so important that Sauron actually look like he could win an epic rap battle of fantasy, even if his high priestess could not. On a darker note, because Sauron outsang Finrod, the elven king and his companions were cast down into the darkest dungeon where they were killed off one by one by werewolves. Finrod was one of the last to die and gave his life that Baron might live. In the books, Aragorn tells the story to the hobbits at Weathertop. It is the lay of Luthien, the elf maiden who gave her love to Baron. But he leaves out Finrod's role entirely. Ain't even mentioned. I ain't even mentioned. I can only hope that Galadriel will learn the true lesson of Finrod's sacrifice by befriending Halbrand. A man and an elf. Circumstances arose. We are companions by chance. But in the meantime, what we know of her path to vengeance raises a few questions. We see Galadriel grieving over Finrod's body that looks like it's been maimed by werewolves. Yet she is not mentioned as being present when Baron and Tenuviel bury Finrod's body. Moreover, the trailers heavily imply that Galadriel's brother died in battle. You have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen. Which isn't untrue, just the battle was more psychological than physical at that point. I do think the trailers are trying to mislead us, for we also know that Galadriel rides north and does some investigating. Sauron was here. I think she's riding north to the ancient site of Angbad, where her brother is said to have died. This fits so much better in my mind. I also accept the show creating this vengeance oath for Galadriel over Finrod's death. 
Her family is known for making ill-conceived oaths of vengeance, and there must have been some reason for the Valar to exclude her from their domain at the end of the First Age. Creating this oath gives Galadriel something to do in the Second Age, besides being vaguely wise. If she was so wise and perfect, like some fans suggest she should be, then why wouldn't she be accepted in Valinor? I am curious to see where they will go with her as a commander of Gilgalad's forces. She is one of the last surviving High Elves who saw the Battle of Morgoth, so she's pretty qualified. Galadriel, commander of the Northern Armies. This position also fits with us knowing she will be given a ring of power once they are created. I anticipate the show will keep her as Gilgalad's commander, and we will see her ride with Gilgalad to the Cracks of Doom at the end of the Second Age, where Gilgalad died. Elrond doesn't mention her being there. Few marked what Isildur did. He alone stood by his father in the last mortal contest, and by Gilgalad only Círdan stood, and I. Odd that the show is setting Galadriel up for a personal vendetta against Sauron when we know Isildur has to be the one to deal the final blow, though she could be elsewhere on the battlefield. I hope her arc is to put aside vengeance, and that as Gilgalad dies, she chooses to build something beautiful instead of destroying something evil. There is still vanity in building Lothlorien, but it is a lesser fault than a vengeance oath, and is a good step on the road of her making peace with the Valar. Dwarf Friend so, Elrond is a friend of the dwarves. I always thought you were my dwarvish for an elf. That's not exactly new. Actually, I'd argue that Tolkien said as much himself describing Elrond in The Hobbit. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. Elrond's role in The Hobbit is recognizing moon runes, which were invisible to everyone, even Thorin. Elrond's ability to recognize and read them indicates he must know dwarvish secrets. This raises the question of how? Elves and dwarves don't usually get along. Look at that. A fox and a hound playing together. The Rings of Power makes the logical leap that if Elrond was Gilgalad's envoy to Linden, the height of elvish dwarvish relations, Elrond would get in on the fraternity in good faith and learn their secrets. I swore an oath to Durin, never to reveal his people's secrets. After all, Elrond is an honorable half-elf. So are they all! All honorable men! but we know he is destined to get jaded by their eventual downfall. Dwarves? They hide in their mountains seeking riches. They care nothing for the troubles of others. Though he still won't be as hostile to dwarves as other elves. In the book, he doesn't so much invite anyone to his council. They just show up. But it says a lot that the dwarves were willing to show up at the house of an elf and expect hospitality. Even dwarves who still hate elves. I will be dead before I see the ring in the hands of an elf. So I like the direction they're taking with Elrond, even if his hair is a bit short. The Southlands. The Rings of Power now tells the tale of a place where no bard has gone before. Singing songs about of course, these people have their place in Middle-earth, though when we see their descendants in the Third Age, their plight is quite bleak. Neither Sam nor Frodo knew anything of the great slave-worked fields away south in this wide realm, beyond the fumes of the mountain, 
by the dark, sad waters of Lake Nurin, nor of the great roads that ran away east and south to bring tributary lands from which the soldiers of the tower brought long wagon trains of goods and booty and fresh slaves. Though their future's quite bright as Aragorn pardons their countries and allows them to govern themselves. It appears that Amazon is not going to give the same nobility to the sylvan elves of the Second Age. Took it upon themselves to make sure they wouldn't step to the dark side again. Here is where the compressed timelines makes me squirm a bit at the artistic liberty. And it centers on this watchtower. Appearing in the show's earliest promotions, I've always presumed it to be the one at Weathertop, as Weathertop is the series' iconic watchtower. But now the revelation that this tower is in the South makes me think of a very different tower, the Tower of Kirith Ungol. This stronghold had been built not to keep enemies out of Mordor, but to keep them in. It was indeed one of the works of Gondor long ago, an eastern outpost in the defense of Ithilien made when, after the Last Alliance, men of Westerness kept watch on the evil land of Sauron, where his creatures still lurk. But as with Narcost and Carcost, the Towers of Teeth, so here too the vigilance had failed. Of course, this cannot be the Tower of Kirith Ungol. That tower was further north, made by men after the First War of the Ring to watch Sauron's actual homeland. So why these elves and why these people? Tolkien tells it as if it were the Eldar and the Dane contra Mundi at the end of the First Age. Morgoth reached deeply into the hearts of many men. Tolkien specified that the Idain were three peoples of men who, coming first to the west of Middle-earth and the shores of the Great Sea, became allies of the Eldar against the enemy. Thus, yes, the Southlanders did side with Morgoth and Sauron in the First Age, and the show is free to embellish that they willingly sent men to fight for him in those wars. Pass this with us all. But I struggle with why the Sylvan Elves are the ones doing the watching now. It's important that Arondir isn't Eldar, since that is how he can have a romance with Bronwyn without contradicting Tolkien's canon. Yet Sylvan Elves had very little to do with the wars between Nordor and Morgoth. Thingol spent most of the First Age guarded in his cavernous realm, hissed at the Noldor for raining on his prey. You and the rest of that fairy tale trash poisoning my perfect world. And Amazon just happens to have chosen a place where we see multiracial people oppressing each other. I don't think Tolkien would be opposed to a story highlighting the evils of oppression generally, but that story would have been better thought out than what I can see of Amazon's version, which I admit is very little, and I am making grand assumptions. Though, they had better come up with one heck of a justification for this thread, else it will scratch the fourth wall in a very unpleasant way. Overall, I'm excited for the show to drop this month. These teasers and trailers have raised some important... Questions. Questions that need answering. For the difference between the histories that Tolkien wrote and the stories that Amazon seeks to tell must include deeper personal conflict and struggle. We will see our great heroes fall, but hopefully Amazon will let them rise to the occasion and the heights that Tolkien wrote them to. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.